strange weather we're having. Lovely stuff. Beautiful stuff. Um, announcement wise, our, our noisy offering is going to Turkey and Syria earthquake, earthquake relief through Lutheran uh, World Relief. Uh, we did the can the first Sunday, and this is the second Sunday, so it's out there in the uh, our next Senate Assembly is coming up April 21 and 22 in Lamar's, Iowa. Opportunity for um, someone to represent us at that event. <coughs> uh, great worship, time there, fellowship with, we, we sit together as a conference, so we're able to uh, uh, people from our region, our regional area. So I encourage you to that's of any interest at all, please let me know, let Linda know, because March 20th is our deadline. So it's like a week from tomorrow is registration deadline. Second Sunday, second communion, so after worship, I just come forward to the rail and we will celebrate the Lord's Supper with you. And I just want a big thank you to all who helped and contributed to the fish fry. It's a great time. I made the mistake of, of asking Mike uh, Hamilton how the fish was down there in St. Paul. Mike's not a big fan of fish. But Carol gave it a resounding approval. So, yeah, and, and her two-year-old grandson just kept eating and eating. Yeah. So anyway, and, and I just thought as I was leaving and Yeah, we should have invited that person. Or that, you know. So think about who you can invite, who, who lives in the area, um, or who you might see. Just come and join the fellowship. And it's so great to have so many here. And we seem to be back to the pre-COVID numbers, I think, was, was really good. Um, so, very good. There's leftover cookies out there. Please take home for um, after church, please. They're on the top where the coffee is in the morning cookies. Please take home anything that's there. We'll start a new March 24th. <laughs> yeah, March 24th. And, uh, uh, yeah, so. and thank you for, for cookies and cornbread and all the, the donations that way. And tonight, for dinner, you could go to the Presbyterian Church and sample all sorts of soups. That's tonight, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, Presbyterian Church is a fundraiser for Heifer International. Um, so don't you know worry about cooking or even doing dishes. Go down there and uh, join the fellowship and uh, bring some uh, ones or fives or change <laughs> to throw. Because you, you vote for the soup and there's a bragging rights trophy for the, the soup that gets the most money contributed to it. Should be great fun. Should be great fun. I'll invite you to stand as able and greet one another. You don't have to move around. And greet one another with a hand shake or fist bump or even a wave if you don't want to.
good news. God so loved the world and humanity, his special treasure, that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you and for your neighbors, your family. God embraces you in divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit's power. Thanks be to God. Now we're gathering the Spirit of God to send upon my heart. Then the people will be able to drink. 
Moses did just as he was told, and as the leaders looked on, water gushed out. Moses named the place Massa, the place of testing, and Meribah, the place of arguing, because the people of Israel argued with Moses and tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord going to take care of us or not? The word of God, words of life. Thanks be to God. Today our responsive reading is taken from <clears throat> Psalm 95, verses 1 through 11. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us give a joyous shout to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving. Let us sing him psalms of praise. Let us sing him psalms of prayer, for the Lord is a great God. The great King of all gods. He owns the depths of the earth. And he the mightiest mountains are his. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God. <coughs> we are the people he watches over, the sheep under his care. Oh, that you would listen to his voice today. The Lord says, don't harden your hearts as Israel did at Meribah, as they did at Massa in the wilderness. For their ancestors tried their patience. They poured my wrath, though they had seen my miracles. For forty years I was angry with them, and I said, There are a people whose hearts turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger I made a vow. They will never enter my place of rest. Today's second reading is as refreshing as a drink of cold water on a hot day. The good news that even while we are lost in sin, God sends the Holy Spirit to fill us with the joy of God's love and reconciliation with sinners through Jesus, our friend. Now the reading from the fifth chapter of Romans beginning with verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of highest privilege where we now stand and be confident and joyfully look forward to the sharing of God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know they are good for us. They help us to learn and endure. And endurance develops strength of character in us. And character strengthens our confident expectation of salvation. And this expectation will not disappoint us. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now no one is likely to die for a good person, though someone might be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's judgment. For since we were restored to friendship with God by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be delivered from eternal punishment by his life. So now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God, all because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done for us in making us friends of God. The word of God, words of life. Thanks be to God. Joseph's well was there. 
And Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noon time. So the Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. He was alone at that time because his disciples had gone into the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who I am, you would be asking me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, and this is a very deep well. Where would you get this living water? And besides, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his cattle enjoy it? Jesus replied, People soon become thirsty again after drinking this water, but the water I give them takes away thirst altogether. It becomes a perpetual spring within them, giving them eternal life. Please, sir, the woman said, give me such, some of that water, then I'll never be thirsty again. I won't have to come here to haul water. Go and get your husband, Jesus said. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Jesus said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You have had five husbands, and you aren't married to the man you're living with now. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place to worship what we Samaritans claim it's here at Mount Gerizim, where our ancestors worship? Jesus replied, Believe me, the time is coming. It will no longer matter whether you worship the Father here or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know so little about the one you worship. Well, we Jews know all about him. For salvation comes to the Jews. But the time is coming. It is already here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Father is looking for anyone who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, well, I know the Messiah will come, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. And Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Just then the disciples arrived. They were astonished to find Jesus talking to a woman but none of them asked him why he was doing it or what they had been discussing. The woman left her water jar beside the well and went back to the village and told everyone, Come and meet the man who told me everything I ever did. Can this be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. The Gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Lives are transformed 
through encounters with Jesus in his earthly ministry. Last week it was Nicodemus. This week it's the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. Next week it's a man who was born blind. And for example of that detail, we're informed right up front about this well, and it's a special place. It's significant to all of Israel, even the Samaritans, because their common ancestor Jacob and his family, his flocks, drank and were sustained by this water, just like the Old Testament lesson tells us God provided water in the wilderness. On the day of this event, John reports that Jesus, kind of an unusual characteristic for Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, he was tired from his long walk. He sat wearily beside the well about noontime. The disciples had gone to town to acquire some food. And along the way, I'd like to imagine that they passed this woman who was going the other way, carrying her water jar. Something other women would have done earlier in the day. You've probably been told this detail in previous sermons you've heard on this passage. Previous encounters with this passage, you know this woman has an identity, not just as a Samaritan woman. Nicodemus, in his community, was known as a wise and devout religious leader. But the woman we meet in today's gospel had the unfortunate notoriety in her village of having had numerous marriages, was living with a man she was not married to, and it's so easy for us to speculate about her based on what Jesus told her that he knew about her. But that's not why John includes that detail in this, in this event. Let's review it from her point of view. As she's walking alone, carrying her jar out to the well, she might have been praying. She might have been complaining bitterly to God about her life, how miserable it was, asking why she should even go on living. And when she saw this group of disciples walking towards her, talking among themselves, happy, in good fellowship, she might have wondered, what do they think of me? A woman walking alone, carrying a water jar this time of day. Theologian David Close says we should know that neither John is the narrator or Jesus, whose words John reports, mentions sin or calls for repentance. With regard to the painful reality of this woman's life, Rather, from the very beginning of the encounter, Jesus sees her and treats her as a fellow child of God. Not even distinguishing her or disregarding her as a Samaritan. When Jesus, when Jesus revealed what he knew about her later in the conversation, it's that we should know her pain, her personal pain. Because of her marital history, the other women would not associate with her. We can imagine that she's been shamed by women who she respected, and she continues to judge herself in the, their eyes. I imagine all she wanted to do was, was go out to the well, get her water, but there at the well was a man, Jewish by attire. What a shock when he said to her, Please give me a drink. Theologian David Lowe's again says that Jesus asking for a drink shows his need of vulnerability. His request. Well, whenever we ask someone for something, don't we experience that, that we're being a little bit vulnerable? We typically don't like to show our need. We would quickly answer, oh, I got this. Well, together we notice what occurs because Jesus invited her generosity. He doesn't 
treat his request as a power play, as she might have expected from a Jewish stranger. Still, she's, she's guarded. But Jesus doesn't critique her or pity her. He sees her and talks with her as a person. Going back to the passage. The woman was surprised. Her Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, You're a Jew. I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If only you knew. And we know who he is, don't we? If only you knew the gift that God has for you and who I am. You would ask me and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't have a rope or a bucket, she said. It's a very deep well. Where are you going to get this living water? And by the way, are you greater than our ancestor, Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his cattle enjoyed? Who took pride in that history, in that identity? But like Nicodemus last week, her understanding is limited. It's been shaped by the society that she lives in. But two things, I believe, will help her move beyond this limitation. One, her desire to be known as a person of value and dignity, her true identity, and faith that the God of her ancestors wants this for her too. But first, she must know that in God's eyes, Jesus' eyes, she's not defined or condemned by her present circumstances. That receiving God's mercy and love through Jesus, the Messiah, she will be set free to be that person she desires to be and trust that God will provide for her to be. To bring her pain to light, Jesus told her, go and get your husband. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. Then Jesus naming her pain, the way she felt seen and defined by her neighbors and family, I note that her response was not as sharp or as defensive as it had been at the beginning when he asked for a drink. Now her words reflect perhaps a little bit that her heart and mind might be open to this grace that Jesus is offering. Yet her request is also kind of a test. A test to see if he really cares about her and Samaritans, or is he just an arrogant Jew? But we're blessed to hear Jesus' response. His words of promise to her are also for us. They're valid for us and ours today. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, what is it that with you Jews, you insist Jerusalem is the only place to worship while we Samaritans claim it's here on Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, believe me, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father here or in Jerusalem. But the time is coming, it's already here, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is looking for anyone who will worship Him that way, for God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said, well, I know the Messiah is coming. The one called Christ. When He comes, He will explain everything to us. And Jesus said, I am the Messiah. And they can show wonder about those words that he has spoken. Just then the disciples survive and the woman departs. She leaves her water jar there beside the well and goes back to the village and surprisingly to me she tells everyone come meet the man who told me everything you already know about me. Could this be the Messiah? And again, surprise, what did they do? They came out to see. What could so impress this woman? Let's go see. Uh, 
I believe the one thing which can explain this transformation and joy this woman receives is that through faith she came to understand that God does value her, sees her as she is, what she has done, what's been done to her, and still values her and claims her as one of his beloved children. Such faith is powerful and contagious. For it will flow up in human hearts as living water. This is why Jesus came that we might receive that living water. Receive it from the one who was crucified and raised to life again. That nothing that happens to us could be worse than that. And God raised his son, he will also raise us up with him. This is the good news that we are entrusted with, the gospel we share, so that all might receive faith in God's unconditional love for them, and not just for them, but for all others. To become true worshipers of God, in spirit and truth. Now I'll finish the reading. And notice what Jesus has to say about the abundance of the harvest and the role of the disciples in it. And we can imagine that we also have a role. But it's God's work. God's work. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging Jesus to eat. No, he said, I have food you don't know about. Who brought it to him? They asked each other. And Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. Do you think the work of harvesting will not begin until summer ends and four months from now? Look around you. Vast fields are ripe all around us and are ready now for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages and the fruit of the harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike. You know the saying, one person plants, another one harvests, and it is true. I send you to harvest where you did not plant. Others have already done the work, and you will gather the harvest. Many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman said, He told me everything I ever did. And when they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. So he stayed two days, long enough for many of them to hear his message and believe. Then they said to the woman, now we believe because we have heard him ourselves, not just because of what you told us. We've heard him ourselves. He indeed is the Savior of the world. Isn't that what we want? Others to believe not what we say, but to come into a relationship with Christ because maybe what we said encouraged them to explore and to see that that be true for them also. Let's pray. Gracious and merciful God, we praise you for revealing to us through your word the power of your love for all. Empower us with your living water to see one another as you see that freed from envy, criticism, and pity, we may become and live as the persons you, your grace provides for us to be, and worship you always in spirit and truth, to your glory, now and forever. Amen. And now I can pray. Jesus, the very Father.
salvation from God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, by belief in Jesus Christ, His only Son and Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the rest. Amen. Please be seated as we receive our offering and those portions of home. The address is there on the screen. Worship God with your offering. Bring an end to war 
and humanitarian care to the people of Ukraine, Syria, and Turkey. Merciful God, we receive our prayer. We pray for those who suffer in mind, body, or spirit. Be present with all who are lonely and give courage to all who are afraid. Comfort those who live with chronic illness or other sickness, especially Jackie, Sally, Ron, Pat and Howard, Connie and Don, Marcine and Terry, Jane, Ruth, Jonah, Rose, Ron, Robert, Dennis, Marlon, and these we also hold in our hearts. Give them our living water always. Merciful God, we see our prayer. We pray for this and neighboring congregations that our service and worship would glorify you, O God. Nurture our faith and pour your love into our hearts. Enliven our community by the embodiment of God's grace in our lives. Merciful God, we see our prayer. We give thanks for the lives of all our saints, past and present. Their hope in you sustain lives of faith and service. Encourage us with the hope they shared in you. And gather us as one on the day of Jesus' return. Merciful God, we, see our prayer. we lift our prayers to you, O God, trusting in your steadfast love and your promise to renew your whole creation through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. We stand to the Lord's Prayer. With one voice we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into
resurrection and the life. The Holy Spirit of rebirth bless you on your Lenten journey. Rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. 